professors, distinguished guests, my fellow students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the first college assembly in the year of monkey. It is our privilege that today's talk will be given by Professor John Minford, which marks the beginning of Professor Minford's culture and translation series at Hansa Management College. The assembly will also be live broadcast in several classrooms this afternoon. Before the assembly commences, please make sure that your mobile phone remains silent during the talk. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Now, we would like to invite Professor Gilbert Fong, Provost and Dean of School of Translation to introduce Professor Minfit. Professor Fong, please. Thank you. I gotta uh, take a look at my cat paper here before I do anything. That's Mao Ji, if you <laughs> miss the word here. President, uh, Professor Minford, all the guests, uh, colleagues, and uh, students. Professor Minford is no stranger to HSMC, and HSMC is no stranger to Professor Minford. He has been a member of the I was uh, advisory board of the School of Translation for many, many years. In fact, even before the translation program was launched, when it was in its embryonic phase, Professor Minford graciously lent us a helping hand and played an important part in shaping the present translation program. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Right. He actually was the writer, a ghost, ghost writer, of many of our modules that uh, our students are studying today. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is one person in the world of Chinese English literary translation who needs no introduction at all, it is Professor John Minford. However, I will still attempt this rather superfluous task for the sake of courtesy and for the sake of those of you and those of us who are unenlightened. Professor Minford graduated from Winchester College and Borio College of Oxford University with a degree in Chinese studies. Over the subsequent 15 years, he worked closely with Professor David Hawkes on the translation of the story of the stone, which is Sek Tao Gay, which is also known as Hong Lao Mong, the dream of the red timber and the rest, as they say, was history. Here, I would just remunerate uh, a few of the books, of the famous books that we are, fam we are very familiar with that uh, Professor Minford had translated. Uh, besides the story of the stone, Hong Lang Mong, there's a translation of uh, Kam Yong's, Lok Ding Gei, uh, translated as the deer and the Cauldron, and that was in 1997. And then Xun Ji Bing The Art of War, and then uh, Po Chong Ling's uh, Liu Zai Ji Yi. He translated it as The Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio. And uh, recently, in uh, 2014, he also published his translation of the Yi Jing, The Book of Changes, Yi Geng. King. And, uh, and there's one book that's forthcoming, I think, I'm not, I'm not mistaken, it's called The Tao and the Power, Lao Zi, Tao De Jing, Dou De King. So you could see that, you know, he's a very versatile translator. As a matter of fact, he also translated some of the modern writers as well. Is that right? And I also know that he is also a playwright. Am I wrong or not? I haven't seen any of your plays being performed. Perhaps you could do some today. <laughs> right. So uh, we are very, very honored today because he is a world-renowned sinologist and translator. And he served in many institutions, including uh, being the dean of the School of Arts and Social Sciences of the Open U. And then afterwards, he went to he went to uh, 
or he also ran to too, uh, went and ran, right, at the same time, <laughs> running to uh, Provence, the south of France, and trying, I was told, to grow grapes, to make his own wine for some years, right? And I guess he was very happy. I don't know about the wine. I haven't tasted it. So anyway, oh, uh, that has nothing to do with uh, academics. So uh, he was the, uh, he was acting dean uh, at the uh, Open University. And then he came back to Hong Kong. He was the chair professor of the Department of Translation, the Chinese University. And then he went to, and also ran to, <laughs> ran to uh, Australia, become, and became the chair professor of Chinese uh, at the ANU, Australian National University. And uh, there are many, many honors bestowed on Professor Minford. I'm not going to name them all, because it would take a long, long time for, for me to do it. I just hope that he will feel equally as honored to receive the title of the Xin Wai Gin Honorary Professor of Chinese Culture and Translation here at HSMC. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fong. Now, Professor Ho, President of Hansai Management College, represent the Certificate of Xin Wai Qin Honorary Professor of Chinese Culture and Translation to Professor John Minfit. Professor Ho and Professor Minfit, please. Without further ado, let's begin the talk by welcoming Professor Minfit again. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin by expressing my great gratitude to um, my friend Gilbert Fong and to the president of this college and um, to the um, foundation which has so generously supported my visit. It is really an enormous pleasure for me to come back here and um, to have an opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. It's, I've just recently retired from the uni university at, in Canberra, the Australian National University, and I'm enjoying my retirement enormously, especially because I'm busier than ever. Um, and I enjoy teaching and I enjoy talking, as I'm sure some of my former students and friends who are here know that almost nothing will stop me from talking. So um, I'm, I'm enormously honored to be here. I've had, I have a great affection for this place. I came here, as, as Gilbert said, I came here when they were in the planning stages of their translation program. And I really, I really admired the kind of enthusiasm, the, the, the spirit of a new institution with fresh, ideas with no, no sort of handicaps handed down from history and with all sorts of very fine ideals. And I still feel like that about this place. So I'm very happy to be here. And everybody's been looking after me so nicely. And I've been, so far I've only been here two or three days, but I've already enjoyed my stay enormously, even though I flew over from the summer in New Zealand where it was very beautiful weather to rather a chilly, um, you know, uh, late winter, winter's period. Um, however, it's just such a great pleasure to be here. Hong Kong is really my second home, as I've said to various friends today. I li I've lived and taught here for over 15 years. I think I've taught in four different institutions, and all of my children went to school here. And I first came here as a young student in 1966. 
That's 50 years ago, you know, before anyone, any of, I mean, none of you were even a twinkle in your grandparents. I mean, your parents probably weren't even born. In there, you know. So I'm a really old timer, you know. And I remember Hong Kong in 1966 when it was just a sleepy little place, you know. I drove out to the um, New Territories and Sha Tin was a small fishing village, you know. There was nothing here. It was very, very quiet. Very nice, I have to say. Of course, now the population of Hong Kong is twice the population of New Zealand. And, um, you know, it's, it's an extraordinarily vibrant and exciting place. I always am amazed when I come back to Hong Kong. Within a matter of minutes, I pick up this incredible high energy of this place. There's nothing, there's nowhere quite like it in the world. It's a, I have a very, very deep affection for this city. Um, I, 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 I wish especially to thank the Sin Wai Kin Foundation for making this possible because I think they have very honorable I ideals to promote Chinese culture. I mean, that's basically what I've spent my life doing. I've had a lot of fun doing it, so I'm not, con I'm not saying I've been a slave, but it is a very noble ideal, and I, I do thank them very much. Um, I've prepared an awful lot of material and stuff, and I always do. I always prepare much too much material. I'm, I'm a great over-preparer, and then I usually forget about it all and just talk off the top of my head. In fact, I was speaking to a friend of mine in Australia earlier on this afternoon, and he said, John, don't worry, you won't do anything connected to the notes or the PowerPoint. You'll just tell stories because that's what you do. You just tell, you're just a storyteller. And I'll try not to be... Um, I'll try not to do that because I think I owe you something a little more organized. Now, the first thing I want to say is, please, if, if I'm speaking too fast, will some brave person put their hand up? Normally, I nominate somebody, you know, but I won't embarrass any of my former students today by nominating them, will I, Tian Ru? No. So, so, I mean, but please, if, am, am I making myself clearly understood? Yes? Okay, I'm getting a nod. Gilbert, am I speaking clear enough? Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and slow down because I know I tend to get faster and faster. I've also got to keep well away from the edge of the platform, otherwise I'll fall over and then there won't be a talk at all. I shall just be rushed off to hospital. Um, I've, I know exactly what I want to say. I mean, I do have a message. I'm not, I'm not going to preach a sermon or anything, but I do have a message. And you know, I've... I've in my long career, I've, I've supervised and examined a large number of graduate students doing PhDs and things like that. And, you know, when I, when I get to the examination, I only have one question, really, to ask them, which is, do you have a message? Do you have something to say? You know, I know, I know it's important to write the thesis properly and be a scholar or whatever that means, but what I'm really concerned about with all of my students is to encourage them to find out what it is they have to say and to enable them to say it. And that, for me, is what a lot of teaching is about. And I've spent my life as a translator and as a teacher, as a mixture of the two. And so I really, I really have a very strong view about... Is that Simon over there? Hello, Simon. How, how very sweet of you to come. How, how, how very embarrassing, but very sweet. I thought I recognized you, so I've just seen an old friend of mine. I'm overcome with emotion, but I'm also going to control my emotion because that's what I have to do. I'm sitting on the stage. I'm standing up here. Um, so, so, yes, the message. And um, they call it in, in academic lingo, they call it a thesis. You know, you've got to have something to say. And um, I do have something to say, which I feel very passionately about, and that is about the nature of translation and how one should teach it and how one should train translators. It's something that's been on my mind for a very long time. And... Um, now, as, I, as I'm, I've finally retired from my position as a professor, I can actually afford to have some ideas of my own and not to be at the mercy of the academic management, you know, who are always wanting, wanting output rather than ideas. So I can now afford the luxury of having ideas and just spending all my time thinking about them. And I do think about them a great deal because I look around me at different universities where I've taught and I just feel that they really have got it so wrong, so deeply wrong. And so I'm actually planning, I'm going to spill the beans now, I'm actually planning to set up a private academy of my own, which I think is the kind of eccentric, mad thing that old professors are supposed to do when they retire, 
Well, I'm sorry to be so predictable, but that's what I'm going to do, because I want to prove that my ideas work. And anyway, that's, that's, I've given the whole game away. The rest is just more of the same. Um, anyway, I have, prepared, I have prepared a PowerPoint. I don't really believe in PowerPoints. They're just pictures. I shall ignore them mainly, um, but just talk around them. And I don't like this microphone because it's rather heavy, but I will have to speak into it because apparently otherwise they can't record the sound. Um, the, t the topic of this series of talks that I'm giving, and I want to call them talks, not lectures. You know, some of the best things in all of Chinese literature are what they call um, poetry talks, shi hua or ci hua, or, you know, qi hua. And it's a deliberately modest way of describing some of the great works of Chinese literary criticism to call them just chats, you know, talks. What I'm giving are really, you know, what I would call yi hua, just talks about translation. And, um, and, and the main theme, well, there are two themes that really are interconnected. The main themes are the relationship between culture and literature and, and translation. And then the way in which that really should drive um, the training of translators and um, the practice of translation. So, um, I hope I can get this thing to work. It's rather advanced for me. Oh yes, there we go, yeah. So I, I, I'm going to begin um, in a rather strange manner. I'm going to begin by looking at a most wonderful poem which I once learned at school when I was about 13 years old. I went to a very, very old-fashioned school and every week we had to learn poetry by heart and we had to recite it in front of our fellow students. And also at my school, I also learnt to enjoy translating because that's what we did every week. And that was how we learnt, we translated. And it was a very good way of learning, and I still believe still today that translation, if properly taught, is one of the best trainings for the mind that exists because it's very, very demanding, it's very problem-solving, and it encourages both analysis and synthesis. So I think that I like the way that in this college, translation has from the very beginning been one of the core subjects because it reaches out across all kinds of different areas of study, including, of course, um, business. And, and, you know, translating for business is, is a very hard thing to do. I have a very good friend who's a business translator, and I know, I know the demands made upon that person's time. So I'm going to begin by looking at this poem by John Keats, who is my favorite poet in any language. I say that, you know, I, I know that you're all going to tell me, what about Li Bai and Du Fu? But I mean, John Keats, the, the guy lived for 20-something uh, years. I mean, he died in extreme youth in, a terrible, in, a terrible, in terrible circumstances in Rome. But in that very short life, you know, like, like Mozart, or like, you know, Mozart lived longer than him, of course. He just wrote the most superb poetry. And this particular poem um, is entitled on first looking into Chapman's Homer. It's very, very famous. And we all had to learn it at school. Now, of course, our teachers never really told us what the poem was about, because that wasn't their job. We just had to learn it by heart. And, uh, and that was about as much as we were told to do. And I, of course, thought that Chapman was probably one of Keats's friends. And he'd lent him his copy of Homer, you see. And I thought, poor old Keats went home with his friend's copy of Homer and wrote it all down. And that's how stupid I was. And in fact, you see, the truth of the matter is that this is a poem about translation because George Chapman was a great poet, but also a translator. And he translated the whole of Homer's two great epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, into some very remarkable English poetry. And what happened was that Keats was visiting his friend and his friend lent him his personal copy of the Chapman translation of this poem. And, and Keats went home and the next morning he just dashed off a sonnet, an absolutely perfect sonnet of, on the subject of reading a translation. So this is one of the, the great poems about translation and it really says everything that there is to be said about the nature of translation. So, I'm, I'm going to just read it to you, first of all. That's a picture of Keats, which you can enjoy looking at while I read the poem. Um, it's on your handout, or I hope it is. I think it should be on the second page. Yes, if you turn to the second page, I think I have to read it aloud because it's, it's such a joy. 
and this is how the poem goes. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Every time I read that poem, I'm absolutely knocked out by it because it's so perfect. He, has, he was one of these geniuses. I mean, he was able to rhyme completely effortlessly, and he was able to write a technically perfect sonnet without even you know, making the slightest effort. It's the most wonderful poem. But what, what, what really interests me today is to try and convey to you not just that it's a beautiful poem, but that it's, it's um, a poem that's rich in what I call cultural resonance, and that anyone wishing to translate this poem into Chinese, and there are several quite good translations, including one by the great Mu Dan uh, of this poem, and um, has to understand the cultural resonance of this poem. And um, I want to talk very briefly about some of these cultural references in the poem, because what I really want to convince you all of today, and I'm speaking, um, of course, to the students, is that there is no shortcut. Translation is a lifelong pursuit. I've been doing it for, for 50 years, and I'm still studying myself all the time. And that what you have to do is you have to be eternally patient. You know, the great painter, the great Italian painter, Leonardo da Vinci, was once asked to define genius. What is genius? Somebody said, it's a bit like Pilate asking what is truth. Someone said to Leonardo da Vinci, what is genius? Does anybody know what his answer was? I didn't know until a few months ago when my friend told me. His answer was eternal patience. Eternal patience. That from one of the great, the true geniuses of human history. And um, I think with, with translation, you, I'm not talking about being a genius, but there is no, short, there is no shortcut. Um, you just have to go on and on and on, exploring and imbibing um, the, the, the culture, the language, the literature, the entire ambiance of whatever language it is you're translating from. And you, you need to wake up every morning with the understanding that you know nothing, that you still have a huge amount to learn. And only when you reach that point are you ready to even begin to translate. And so let's look at this poem a little bit. First of all, you see, it, it, it announces right from the beginning, from the very title, that it's a poem about Homer. Homer, you know, Homer. I mean, Homer is one of the great fathers of, of Western poetry and his two long epic poems. In fact, Homer probably wasn't one person at all, probably a group of people, and there seems to be a tradition that most of them were blind, and they were, they were storytellers who made up stories using, using formulaic expressions and so on. There's been a lot of scholarship about Homer. But I'm not really interested in the modern scholarship. I'm interested in Homer as a presence in Western culture for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, you see, if you, don't, if you don't have the time to absorb that, you will never really um, make any progress. I mean, if, if you want to become a translator of English, of any kind, really, even, even of modern political writing, for example, um, you have to be prepared to commit yourself to a lifelong study of, of English-speaking culture, and you have to be prepared to be eternally patient about it, because there is no shortcut. And I've just put together a few pictures to sort of give you an idea of how the Homeric, as they call it, the Homeric, tradition lies at the root of so much in, in Western culture, not just English, of course, French, German, Italian, Spanish, you, may, you name it. And here are some, this of course is Keats, and this is the great movie that was made about Keats, you know, with um, Bright Star. I just show that to try to 
you know, to try and liven things up a bit, you know. And there's another rather gloomy picture of poor old Keats. He did have a rather wretched time. And um, so here's Homer. Here's a typical, you know, um, cliched sculpture of Homer, mainly, mainly trying to depict the fact that he was blind, or he, was, he or they, or whatever Homer was. You see, no, I'm not really interested in Homer the person. I'm just interested in these two wonderful long poems, the one about the Trojan War and the other about Odysseus and his travels, the Odyssey. You really can't understand most of Western literature until you've read Homer. And unfortunately, and I say this with great regret, there is really no satisfactory Chinese translation of Homer today. Yang Xianyi, for whom I have an enormous respect and who is a great friend and mentor of mine, he did translate Homer, but he wasn't the right person, really. I mean, he, was, he made a good, a good shot at it, but Homer is still waiting for somebody who will dedicate their life to translating Homer, somebody who will commit for 20 or 30 years, a bit like our friend Huang Guobin committed himself to translate Dante's Divine Comedy, and he spent 20 years doing it, and he had to perfect his Italian, and he had to devise a rhyming scheme that fitted in with Dante's. Somebody's got to do that with Homer, and I, I think it will be a wonderful day when they do, but up till now they haven't. This is George Chapman. This is the translator who was a contemporary of William Shakespeare and wrote a really rollicking translation of Homer, which, um, and, and he looks like a kind of interesting person too. Obviously spent a lot of time trimming his beard by the look of it. And this is the, this is the title page of his, you see what beautiful title pages they had in those days. This is, his, this is his Homer. You see Chapman, you'll see in small letters there. Now, throughout... Throughout the history of Western culture, everybody has got something to say about Homer. This was the great Raphael, and he was, he was depicting all these famous men of letters on Mount Parnassus, and he had to have Homer. And of course, Homer had to be blind, and there he is. And this is a, a Victorian painting. I mean, the Victorians couldn't leave Homer alone. And they had to have, look at this wonderful reading. This guy's reading to, to these sort of young people in all their interesting costumes. And that lady's lying, reclining on the sofa. I mean, this is a Victorian vision of Homer, you know. And this is another Victorian vision of Homer. This time there's a dog in the picture. You know, I don't suppose Homer had a dog at all. But he's being led by a young man because he's blind. So you know, Homer pops up all over the place, you know. Oh, this is Salvador Dali, the great surrealist painter. He had a go at Homer as well. I won't pause on this one, but there's all things melting, and you know, Homer is kind of everywhere and nowhere. And here's Homer, the, the rhapsodist, with his, with his lyre, you know. And here's Homer Simpson, you see. I mean, you can't even understand the Simpsons unless you know something about Homer. Why, would, why was he called Homer, you know? There's, there's a whole deep structure of... And of course, this is what we would call lowbrow culture, but you've got to be prepared to take in lowbrow culture as well. Otherwise, you know, you'll miss all kinds of references, you know. And, and then there's the whole background of Greek, Greek art and Greek history. You, you just can't afford to take shortcuts. You've got to be able, you've got to be willing to say, oh my God, I don't know enough about Greece. I don't know enough about Athens. I don't know enough about Socrates. I don't know enough about Plato or Sappho. You know, they say that Sappho was the first lesbian poet, but recently the research seems to prove that the only thing that was lesbian about Sappho was that she lived on the island of Lesbos, and um, that she was actually not les lesbian at all. So you know, Greece is it, the culture of Greece is eternally alive in in Western in, in Western culture. It it's, cannot be ignored. Another another popular. Uh, um, painting showing Achilles, the great hero of the Trojan War, dragging the unfortunate Hector behind his chariot round the walls of Troy. You know, and recently, of course, there was the famous movie with Brad Pitt. So, I mean, Homer and Achilles, they just don't go away. And here are some Greek warriors on a, on a, on a vase. And then there's the Odyssey, which is the other great poem. And this, of course, I couldn't resist putting this one in because this is the famous scene where the sirens, and of course, in this painting, they're not wearing very many clothes. And they're trying to seduce poor old, uh, poor old Odysseus. And the sailors have tied him to the mast of the ship. And it's, it's a very, everything about the Odyssey is kind of symbolic. 
which is why when James Joyce came to write his great novel, Ulysses, um, he had the entire myth, the whole symbolism of Odysseus in the back of his mind. And almost, almost the whole of modern English literature is kind of shad the, the, the shadow of Odysseus hangs over it. He's, he's one of those eternal symbols. And this is Yang Xianyu, who did translate Homer, but I, he, even he himself admits it wasn't his best work. Because he wasn't a poet. You've got to be able to sing, you know. You've got to be able to produce Chinese that sings like a ballad. And there would have been people, there, there probably still will be people who will do it. And it'll be a great day when they do. Now, another reference in this poem, you see the poem, the poem says, John Keats's poem says, when I read this translation, it was like a whole new world opening up before me. You know, I've read lots of other stuff, all these, you know, the golden, I mean, he, the realms of gold. He says he's traveled in the realms of gold. That means he's read a lot of poetry. But then suddenly he discovered this translation of Homer, and it was like somebody opened a whole door into another new world, and he compares it. He uses two brilliant images to describe that experience, which is the experience of reading a translation of a new work. Don't forget, it's about translation. And he says one of them was about, it was like discovering a new planet. Well, you see, just a little while before he wrote this poem, this man Herschel had discovered the first new planet to be discovered for hundreds and hundreds of years, which was the planet Uranus. And there, there's the telescope that he used. That's supposed to be Herschel discovering it. So this image was very contemporary, very current. And it's a very powerful image that Keats uses to illustrate um, what reading a translation was like for him. It was like discovering a new planet, you know, and um, the other image that he uses is of the Spanish explorer Cortes discovering the Pacific Ocean. Well, actually, he was quite wrong. It wasn't Cortes. It was somebody else. But who cares about that? I mean, that, 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 that's a mere fact. We don't need to be, be upset about that. What he's saying is that the experience of discovering new literature through translation was just the same as the, the first explorers who crossed over Central America and suddenly saw another ocean even bigger than the Atlantic. They never even knew about it before, and suddenly there it was, a new world, a whole new world, a brave new world. And that was all made possible by translation. And there's, there's the rather beautifully dressed Mr. Cortes, one of the conquistadores, they're called, one of the great Spanish. Nowadays, you can't say much good about them because they did terrible things, of course. But in their day, they were heroes, you know, a bit like Achilles. And this, and this is the age of Cortes. I mean, this is the age of exploration. And if you look at this map, um, it's kind of, it puts you in a particular place, a particular moment in history when the world was suddenly becoming a bigger place and people were exploring all, you know, America, Asia, India. They didn't find Australia, um, luckily for the Australians, I mean, the indigenous Australians. And, um, and this, this, this time of exploration was also one of the great periods of translation. The two go hand in hand. Um, all right, well, we'll move on from Keats's wonderful poem, but slightly broaden our sphere and to talk about the roots of, of Western culture because, you know, once you, once you mention Homer, there's, of course, all the other stuff as well, and the, and, and, and the name that immediately leaps to mind is the most wonderful figure in in the history of Western thought, in my humble opinion, and that's the great Socrates. You know, Socrates who was condemned to death for corrupting the young. I hope I won't be taken away and given hemlock um, later on, Gilbert. But anyway, I'm not trying to corrupt the young. I'm just trying to say some things that I think are interesting. But then so was Socrates, you see, and he, 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 he was put to death. And he was the most extraordinarily inspiring person. I've recently and this, this, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say to you. I've recently been rereading Socrates. I had to read Plato, you know, the, 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 the Socratic dialogues. I had to read those as a young student. And um, it was an unforgettable experience. And now, as I, as I enter my retirement, I'm, I'm finding myself drawn back to Socrates. I was reading it last night. It's so moving. This is a man of true integrity. He really had something very deep that he wanted to tell other people about. And he was not going to compromise himself. He would rather die than do that. He was the most inspiring person, a great, great figure. And if you think that's just my opinion, I think I've got the next slide. 
This is someone I'm sure you all know in any business school, you know, Steve Jobs. Not a nice person, I'm afraid, but a very, very successful entrepreneur. And he, he was quoted as saying, I would trade all of my technology for an afternoon with Socrates. And there you go, that's Steve Jobs. If you don't believe me, you'll probably have to believe him. Um, again, like Homer, Socrates has been part of Western culture throughout you know, the last 2,000 years. And, and in recent times, you know, people can't resist doing paintings. Here he is with a disciple, and the disciple is not enough to make the pa painting interesting, so they introduce a young lady. And um, here he is on his deathbed about to take the poison, the hemlock that will kill him, surrounded by his disciples. This is another painting. It's one of the fav favorite subjects for painters. And this is a great portrait of Plato, who, of course, is the person who wrote the most about Socrates, by the great painter Raphael. Now, as a slight detour, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that if it were not for Arabic scholarship in the Middle Ages, we would simply not have Socrates and Plato. It was, the, it was the Arabic scholars who translated some of these early Greek thinkers into Arabic. And, and their Arabic translations then prompted the whole revival of ancient Greek learning during the Renaissance. So yet again, translation played a key role in the whole life of Western culture. And at that time, you know, because the, because the Arabs had already invaded Spain, they set up important translation centers in cities like Toledo and also in Baghdad. These were centers of translation because at that time, the Muslim world, the Islamic world, was very open and very, um, and very, very learned. Some of the finest and oldest universities in the world were actually in places like Morocco. And, um, and there were some very fine translators working out of Greek and Latin into Arabic. And this is, um, this is a gentleman that I'm going to come across later. He's called Benjamin Jowett. And he, was, he, was, he, he went to my college at Oxford, Balliol College, and he was a great translator of Greek, of, of Plato. He, in fact, his translations of Plato are still, are still being printed today, and they read very, very well. And I want, to, I want to mention him especially because he was very influential on one of the four Chinese scholars I shall be talking about in the, in the weeks to come. But before, before him, and this is where I'm going to pause for one moment, well, to have a drink of water, actually, but... Um, um, if you look on page two of your handout, you'll see that I, I, I have a heading there called the lineages of translation. Now, what's a lineage? A lineage is, of course, it's a line of transmission. If, if I'm Mr. Smith's student and Mr. Smith was a student of somebody else, that's a kind of lineage. Things get handed down from one teacher to another student who then becomes a teacher of another student, and so on. And that's a lineage. And in, 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 in the world of translation the, of Chinese, which is what I'm talking about, really, the first lineage was the lineage of the Jesuits. Now, some of you may not know who the Jesuits were. They're, they're an order within the Roman Catholic Church, but they're the most intellectual of all the Roman Catholic orders of monks and very, very brilliant thinkers. And um, they were the first people to really translate Chinese literature into a Western language. Of course, they translated into Latin, because Latin was the language used by all of the scholars in Europe as a common language, what they called a lingua franca of Europe. And their translations were very, very influential in the Europe of the 18th century, the so-called period of the Enlightenment. And um, as a result of many of these translations, China's influence was enormous during that time. And this is a, a picture from one of those early Jesuit books showing two Jesuit fathers holding up a map of China, you see. There's China. Oh, I can use this, this funny gadget, sorry. <laughs> It'll be fun, I've never used one of these before. There we are. There we are. There, there's a Jesuit father, you see, and there's another one. And they've got this map, which is very conveniently being held up by an angel, right? And up here, of course, is, 
is the, is the light of God, uh, of Jesus. And here are some more early, early Jesuit fathers. But they're basically opening up the gate that opens onto the great world of China, you know. And they were amazing people. And um, they're some of my heroes, actually. And um, fantastically learned and very, very open-minded people who, who engaged with China at a depth that has never been equaled. And this is something that people very quickly forget. They think that everything new is best, you know. Actually, everything new is not necessarily best at all. And a lot of American scholarship about China is actually extremely superficial. Whereas these guys really knew what they were talking about. And the great emperor Kangxi, you know, of the early 18th century, one of his advisors was in fact a Jesuit priest who taught Kangxi how to read the great classic, the I Ching. I mean, imagine, imagine today um, the chairman of everything. What's his name? Xi Jinping. Imagine him having you know, a Western advisor who sits in his office all day explaining to him what to do. It's inconceivable. But Kangxi actually had a couple of Western um, Jesuit fathers helping him to understand this great Chinese classic, the I Ching. It's, it's, it's a situation that's never been equaled since then. And um, they were eternally patient. These Jesuits spent their lives studying. That's what they did. And of course, you, I don't need to tell you who this is. It's not Socrates, it's not Homer. It's our old friend, Mr. Confucius. And um, you see him everywhere, wherever there's a Confucius Institute. I won't say anything more about that. Um, and this is one of the earliest translations of Confucius done into Latin by, by the Jesuits. You know, Principis Confuci Vitae Philosophorum Sinensis. I mean, I, uh, it's, 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 their, their achievements are unbelievable. Now, I'm going to jump very, very completely haphazardly now into another area of translation because the only thing that's really common to all the things I'm talking about is that they're all about translation. Now, this gentleman here is the most extraordinarily brilliant French novelist called Honoré de Balzac. And if you haven't read any of his novels, I beg you, if you do anything else, forget about my entire talk. Forget about it, throw it away, but go and read a novel by Balzac because he is absolutely brilliant. I never realized how brilliant he was until a friend bullied me into reading one of his novels. I thought he was probably rather boring. You know, I thought he might be like Charles Dickens or something, who I find very boring. But actually, he's not boring at all. Well, for a start, he's French, you know, and he's passionate. Look, look, at, look at that gesture. Look at the man. I mean, he was an absolute giant and, um, and a man of enormous appetites in almost every direction. And he wrote these novels that just, they're like, they're like something on the boil from the first page to the last page. He had the kind of energy that, that you don't come across in any other novelist, in my experience. And um, now Balzac, you know, was a great a great writer. And as, as a kind of footnote, I'd like to point out that my teacher, um, Professor Hawkes, one of the greatest translators of the last century, um, he read the whole of Balzac in French. I mean, he was a man of eternal patience. He read the whole of Dante in Italian. He read Cervantes' Don Quixote in Spanish, you know. And of course, he also read Thomas Mann in German. And he was, he was a man who just had an insatiable appetite. And, and he just wanted to go on and on and on, right up until his dying day. That, that was why he was such a superb translator, because he, he had acquired, he had enjoyed, he had, he had just swallowed just huge amounts of the culture, not only of of the West, and not only of France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and so on, let alone English. I mean, he read all the novels of Henry James, all the novels of George Meredith. He read everything. But he also read Japanese and Chinese. And um, that's why he was such a brilliant translator. I mean, of course, there were other things as well. But he had the resources. He had the cultural repertoire. He had it within him. It was part of him. And he acquired that over a long life. But he acquired it because he cared passionately about literature and about the human spirit. And he knew his role was to, to try and transmit something very, very important in Chinese, which was the novel Hong Lo Meng. And he dedicated his life to doing that. But he dedicated it at a point where he had already 
filled himself up to the very top with everything that was available um, uh, in his own culture and in the culture of China. And, you know, China was incredibly fortunate to have the most wonderful translator of Balzac, and his name was Fu Lei. And Fu Lei dedicated his life to translating the works of Balzac. I have the complete translations of Fu Lei. And what a remarkable man. I mean, he was, again, eternally patient. In fact, he was what we would call today obsessive. He just never left his study. Poor Mrs. Foulet, you know, had a hard time of it, and so did his two sons. But I'm not here to talk about psychotherapy for translators, although I think it's a very important topic. I mean, translators are very peculiar people. Beware of them, you know. <laughs> they don't behave like normal human beings because they tend to be obsessed with what they're doing. And Foulet was definitely obsessed and a brilliant translator, a brilliant stylist in Chinese, but also someone who lived in France and who knew about the French culture and who, it was part of his life, you see, he lived it. I mean, one of the things I find myself saying to translators when they come to me to study and they're translating, let's say, a novel about, supposing they're translating a great French novel like Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary, you know, which is a novel about a middle-aged woman who suddenly wants to ha enjoy her freedom. And, 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 the, and these young translators come to me and they talk about problems. And I just say to them, listen, you're 23 years old. You haven't lived. You need to go away and come back and see me in about 30 years' time. And then we can talk about translating Madame Bovary because, frankly, you have no idea what it's all about. You've got to live, you know. You've got to go out there and experience life. Otherwise, how can you hope to translate a writer who is distilling a rich experience of life? You don't stand a chance. So there again, not only do you have to absorb culture, but you also have to absorb life, and you have to be willing to experience life. So translation can be the most wonderfully rewarding vocation, occupation, art, but it makes demands upon you which are not just about dictionaries and words. You know, It's about not just culture, but about life, about experience. And some of the great translators led, led extremely... Um, disordered lives, I have to say. I mean, I won't, I won't tell any stories about my friends, but I mean, I know some very fine translators who were able to translate because they had experienced a very rich um, uh, cross-section of life. Anyway, this is Foule, who famously committed suicide at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, he and his wife. They were, they were subjected to such terrible persecution. They just went home and hung themselves from a beam in the house of somebody that I think both Gilbert and I know, Stephen Sung, in Shanghai. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm at the moment working on his book of letters called the uh, Fule Jashu, and I shall be giving a class about that later on in March because it presents huge problems of cultural understanding huge problems, because he was such a richly cultured man, and his letters are very hard to translate. Um, so we're talking about lineages, and, and there was the Jesuit lineage. There's also a very fine German lineage of translation, and I'm, I'm not going to have time to talk about it very much today, but this is the great founder of the German lineage. His name was Richard Wilhelm, and um, he had a very fine Chinese collaborator. If I come back here one day and I, I might. I think if I, I, the topic I would choose for another series of lectures would be Chinese collaborators in translation because it's a fascinating topic. And this was one such man. He, he worked together with that German and he was one of the old school Chinese um, men of letters. His name was Lao Nai Xuan. There you are. Fascinating man. Again, he was a receptacle of Chinese culture. He, he knew everything. And of course... Um, the other thing that, that, that is so important is that the translator is part of his own culture, part of the, of the currents of thought. And Richard Wilhelm was a great friend of Carl Gustav Jung, perhaps one of the half dozen most important thinkers in Germany in the 20th century. So he was, again, he was living, he, he lived his life in a very meaningful way. And translation was the chosen um, vehicle for him to express himself. Now I'm sort of getting close to the end because now I'm giving, I think, what they call a trailer for my, last, for my four um, public lectures, 
which are going to be about the British lineage of translation. Now, I'm not just giving you know, um, abstract historical talks. I'm still concerned with my main message, which is how can we learn from these people so that we can improve our practice of translation and the way we teach it, the way we train translators. What is it? What is the key? What is the key to the eternal patience that creates good translation? And um, I'm showing a couple of pictures here of Oxford because I like Oxford very much, architecturally, not academically. And uh, <laughs> I can say that having been there myself. But, and um, these are famous heads outside the, um, outside the Sheldonian theatre. Nobody quite knows what these heads are, but I always imagined them to be sort of anonymous Greek philosophers of one sort or another. And this is a rather nice print of the wonderful Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, it's, it's from a 17th century book. And the Bodleian Library is still one of the great treasures of the world. The things that, the, the things that one can discover in the Bodleian Library are quite remarkable. It's one of the great libraries. And this is one of the great Oxford figures in the history of um, translation. He translated basically everything that Plato ever wrote. And he did it very, very well. And the important... The important thing about him is that he had a huge influence on this man. And that's my first, my first guy, my number one boy, so to speak. And James Legg, who translated all of the Chinese classics. I mean, what a phenomenal man. He totally dedicated his life to that task. He, tr he started off by translating Confucius, the Lun Yu, and Meng Zi, and the Da Xue, and the Zhong Yong. And then he went on to translate, you know, the Shi Jing and the Chun Shu Zuo Zhuan and the Yi Jing. He translated everything just about. And, and of course, the, the, the Shang Shu. Um, I mean, just to translate one of those books would be a lifetime's work. I spent 12 years translating the Yi Jing, you know. And, um, and this guy, I mean, first of all, he's from Scotland. I mean, that says a great deal about him because the Scottish, they don't just drink whiskey, they do serious stuff, you know. And he's. <laughs> He, now, he is a remarkable man, as was his predecessor, Robert, uh, Robert Morrison. But Legg was a fascinating character, and I've uncovered some quite interesting details about his private life, which I shall be revealing um, on Saturday, actually, to come. Um, among other things, he had a pet crocodile, which he used to swing around his head. So I, I thought I'd come in on Saturday with a pet crocodile, but I won't be able to find one in Hong Kong. <laughs> Um, he was obviously one of those wonderful Oxford eccentrics, you know, and nobody's prepared to say that because people write books about him and it's all got to be serious academic. Uh, sorry, there's a rude word there which I'm leaving out. But, and the fact that he had a, a pet crocodile that he used to swing around his head doesn't really seem to, doesn't seem to speak to the academics, you know. I'm a retired academic now, so I can say whatever I like. Um, I'm not applying for promotion or extension or anything, you know. And I have to say that so much of what I've been reading about James Legg recently um, leaves a great deal to be desired. I shan't mention any names. Um, this is another picture of the great Confucius. Now, you see, Confucius, there's another interesting person. My goodness, what a fascinating individual. But um, don't believe most of what you're told about him, especially by the Confucius Institute. He was a very, very interesting individual, highly eccentric, and this is a typical page from one of James Legg's translations. And what, you see, what's interesting to me is not only was James Legg part of the Oxford lineage of translation, not only was he extremely influenced by Benjamin Jowett and the Oxford School, he also was very, very influenced by the Chinese tradition of writing commentaries. And you've only got to look at the layout of this page. This is a translation, but... The Chinese takes up half the page, you know, in very large characters. Now, nobody else in the history of translation has done that. But Legg was doing it with a very definite rationale, which is that he wanted to be like a Chinese commentator. He wanted to not just translate, but to transmit and to explain what was going on behind the text. And really, the essence of his, of his work is in those little tiny footnotes at the bottom. And his work is still today, um, 150 years later, it's still of enormous value. He was a great translator, and he had eternal patience. 
The second, the second of my four boys uh, is Herbert Giles. Now, Herbert Giles, unfortunately, went to Cambridge. However, um, he, was, he was another ex a complete eccentric, but he was obsessed with translating completely different kinds of Chinese. He translated Pu Song Ling's Liao Jai Zhi Yi. He translated the, the wonderful Zhuangzi, you know, into, into beautiful late Victorian prose. And Oscar Wilde, the great Oscar Wilde, who went to Oxford, uh, he read Herbert Giles's translation of Zhuangzi and said it's the most important book about the modern world he ever read. That was typically Oscar Wilde being funny, but I mean, that was the great tribute to Herbert Giles. And he was a very, very difficult man. He always lost his temper. And, and I know his great grandson who lives in Australia. And he fell out with all of his children. Herbert Giles was one of these terrific late Victorian eccentrics and a brilliant translator. But also, I've got some very juicy examples of how he, how he changed the Chinese to suit the tastes of late Victorian readers. This is one of the stories from the Liao Jai, which I translated myself. And then the third of my boys is a man called Arthur Whaley, who was, again, a wonderful English eccentric. I think all these people were English eccentrics. You know, England seems to, well, Britain, I should say, because, of course, James Legg wasn't from England. He was from Scotland. But, I mean, the British Isles has a wonderful tradition of producing eccentrics. Thank goodness, because it also produces some very, very stuffy non-eccentrics and ordinary people. But it does also, it just keeps coming up with these wonderful eccentrics. It's what keeps the place bearable for a short period of time. And uh, this is Arthur Whaley, who is a fantastic translator of Chinese poetry. And I shall talk about him. He's my number three boy. And there he is playing the recorder. He enjoyed playing the recorder. He enjoyed skiing. He went skiing every year in Switzerland, and um, he was a man famous for his silences. You know, he would, he would greet people at the front door and say nothing for at least half an hour. <laughs> and what, a, what an austere looking man. But he was absolutely amazing. He read everything. I mean, he, he knew at least 10 languages, but he kept on reading for the sheer pleasure of it. Again, an example to inspire us all that there is no shortcut. To his dying day, he was still exploring and reading new languages, new texts, and so on. And um, he was also a great friend of my teacher, Professor Hawkes. In fact, Professor Hawkes was his literary executor. And of course, this is Tao Yuanming, the great Chinese poet. And, and Arthur Whaley had a special affinity. He especially liked Tao Yuanming, and he translated him very, very well. He liked three poets especially, Tao Yuanming, um, Bai Zhuyi, and Yuan Mei. They were his three favorite poets. And you can tell from those three poets what kind of a person he was, you know, because there was something they all had in common. He hated Li Bai. He couldn't stand the poet, you know, because he said he's such a, he's such a sort of uncontrolled, um, you know, Arthur Whaley was a gentleman, you see. He, he lived in Bloomsbury, and his friends were, most of them were aristocratic people who lived in large country houses. And something about Li Bai just disgusted Arthur Whaley. He wrote a book about him, which is one of the worst books ever written about Li Bai, because he really didn't like Li Bai at all. But he liked Tao Yuanming, Bai Zhuyi, and Yuan Mei from the 18th century. And this is David Hawkes, my fourth boy. And he was Arthur Whaley's, one of Arthur Whaley's young men. They were all known as Arthur Whaley's young men. And um, he became Arthur Whaley's literary executor. That means when Arthur Whaley died, it was David Hawkes who looked after all of his papers. And when David died, I became his literary executor. So that's what I mean by a lineage. These are all my, my forebears. And David taught me at Oxford. And later on, um, we became very, very close friends, and I worked with him on the Hong Lo Meng project. And um, there he is in his, li in his library in Oxford working on Hong Lo Meng. And that's just a page from Hong Lo Meng, from the first chapter of that wonderful novel. And he gave up his job at Oxford. He gave up his professorship in order to do this translation. And uh, he very generously invited me to collaborate with him. And we neither of us had a penny. We were very, very poor but we just did it because we had to. As he said to me one day, we're just doing this for the hell of it, you know. 
And people often ask me, what does that mean, especially Chinese? How, what does it mean to say you're doing something for the hell of it? Does that mean you hate doing it? And I said, no, it's the opposite. It's a very English idiom. You do something for the hell of it means you just do it because you've got to do it, because you, if you don't do it, you'll never forgive yourself. And you may not be making any money out of it, but you just, you just got to do it, you know? And it's a, it's a wonderful expression. It wouldn't make any sense to the stu students of translation theory, I suppose, but I don't... <laughs> But we don't talk about translation theory in my presence, anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's a dead end, if ever there was one. This, this, is, this is a wonderful photograph of David's wedding in Peking in 1950. And it took place in the British Embassy, the British Legation in Peking. And I could talk about all the individuals here, but I only want to mention two of them. This man here, that's not a beard, by the way. That's a, that's, a, that's a hole in the photograph. He looks like he's got a very funny beard, but actually it's not. He had a beard, but a quite small one. And he's, the, he's a poet called William Empson, and he was a great friend of David's. And this over here is one of the leading literary figures from Cambridge at the time, a man called I.A. Richards. And he and Empson were very close. And these were the people that David um, sort of came to his mature stage, living with these people in Peking in the most extraordinary um, environment. And um, it, it changed his life. I'm interested in the lives of translators. I don't give a damn about theory. I don't think it ever makes sense. Um, as anyone who's been my student knows, I'm a, I'm a veteran hater of translation theory. I'm happy to say so. I'll give you an example. Um, very briefly, because I'm almost finished, actually. There's a maid in Hong Lama. Her name is Hua Xiren. And, um, and, and um, Xiren means literally like invading the person. It's all about how the aroma of a flower, the scent of a flower, sort of pervades somebody. And one morning, David was in his study, and he couldn't think how to translate this maid's name. And he was making more and more noise, complaining about it. And his wife, Jean, who is still alive, was in the kitchen making coffee. And she called out, I know this story because she told it to me. She called out to his study, what's the matter, David? You're sounding so angry. He said, I can't think what to call this bloody maid. Well, you know, calm down. What does it mean? And he explained to her what it meant. And she was in the kitchen making coffee, instant coffee, and she had a jar of Nestle's, you know, coffee. And it said, new, fresh aroma, right? So she called out, why don't you just call her aroma, right? And that's how she got the name Aroma. So try and fit that into some translation theory if you can. I don't think it'll work. And he, he himself once said that there's no sense in translation theory whatsoever. And this is him. Oh, here's William Empson with his actual beard. So his beard's quite big, but not as big as on the other picture. And, that, and they were the people that David Hawkes lived with in Peking. And they were his first experience of what he would what I would describe as the bohemian lifestyle, because they were very free-living artists, and she's a, she's a South African sculptor, and a very, very important influence on his life and on his development as a translator. These are his notebooks. Now, have you ever seen a foreigner write such beautiful Chinese characters? I haven't. I've, I've heard Chinese look at this and, th and say, to them, say to me, how is that possible? How could, a, how, could a, how could a Westerner write such an impeccably neat and beautiful Chinese? The answer is that he just practiced all the time. He just wrote and wrote and wrote. And he could write actually a very fine cao shu, you know, grass script. Because he was, he was passionate. He was completely and utterly obsessed. He was devoted to this whole business of transmitting uh, a great Chinese work. And these are his notebooks on translating the Hong Lamong. That's another page. I think I've pretty much finished, actually. Um, I want to just end by, um, <clears throat> end by um, summarizing rather simply what I've tried to say, which is that I believe that to train a translator or to develop as a translator oneself, one has to do more than just um, learn words, you know? I think the French have a wonderful word for it. It's, the word is formation. And formation is like, people think it just means education. It doesn't. Formation, it's like the German word Bildung. It means the creation of a whole person, the actual training that, that places emphasis not just on words, but on ideas, on character, on, on philosophy. And the French are very, very good at that. And 
I believe, you see, that learning to be a translator is a bit like what's going on here. This is a picture of the, of the, of the traditional Taoist system where you, where you combine, in this case, it's the, the dragon and the tiger, you see, and they, they're like the yin and the yang, and they combine within you. It's the process of self-development, and that, for me, is a very good illustration of what I call um, self well, what I call formation, and what the Chinese call xiu yang, you know, self-cultivation. And of course, it's of course very, very close to the traditional idea of kung fu, you know, of actually training in the martial arts, or in Peking opera, or in um, painting, or calligraphy, or any of the other great traditional Chinese branches of artistic expression. And I want to end with this picture because it's one of the great masters of Tai Chi Chan, of the Yang school. And you see, this is a kind of Kung Fu. And I believe that translators need to be encouraged to develop themselves, not just as technical wizards with a command of words, but as people who continually become more and more deeply um, engaged with the culture that they're studying and translating, and also with their own culture so that they can they can have a true formation, a true self-cultivation. There is no shortcut. It is a question of eternal patience. But at the end of the road, we have a real end result to be proud of and to be happy with, and something that will make people genuinely happy and fulfilled, and will serve the purpose of making the world's cultures communicate with each other. And what, could be, what higher ideal could any individual have than to be part of that? It's one of the things, you know, now that I've reached the age of 70, I can say this. I'm 70 by Chinese counting, not by Western counting. But that, I, li I like to be Chinese in, in, in calculating my age. It entitles me to a free bus pass, you see. And, um, <laughs> but so I can say that if you, if you engage in translation on that level, it's so incredibly fulfilling. It's also incredibly important, you know. It really is very important. I believe that the translation of Hong Lomong in the long run will do more for the understanding between the, the people of China and the people of the English-speaking world than anything else. I can't think of anything else that will be so um, helpful. And in that noble cause, it really is worthwhile to have eternal patience. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Minford, for the inspiring talk. And now with the Q&A section, please feel free to ask questions about today's talk. And thanks, Professor Minford, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'm actually from Beijing. I'm from Communication University of China. Uh, last year, we were asked to translate uh, um, a Kung Fu TV series, um, The uh, Semi-Devil and the... Uh, Oh, the demigods and the semi-devils. And um, we have encountered uh, enormous difficulty in expressing the Kung Fu culture. Um, but the, the, we only do that for YouTube channels, so it's kind of easier than translating the actual novel. So uh, I know that you have translated two wonderful Kung Fu novels, uh, The Deer and the, the Kendron, and also The Book and the Sword. Do you have uh, any strategies or ideas um, about how to translate uh, Kung Fu culture to Western readers? That is my first question. My second question that uh, just now that you mentioned, uh, um, Yang Xianyi's translation of Homer is not his uh, best uh, work. Uh, I'm very curious uh, if we study we want to learn a translation from Yang Xianyi. In your opinion, uh, what books are Yang Xianyi's best uh, works? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> you don't mind, I shall, I shall remain seated because I've, I've been standing up for rather a long time. Um, I'll answer your first question first um, about translating Wu Xia Xia Shuo. Um, I, did, I, I dedicated several years to working on. Uh, on uh, Lu Dingqi. Actually, the Shu Jian Un Chou Lu was by somebody else. I just edited the translation, so I take no real responsibility for that. And uh, the Lu Dingqi is very long, you know. 
and I worked on it with David Hawkes. In fact, he translated more than half. He just didn't want his name on the book. <laughs> I won't go into the reasons why. Uh, he thought it was very badly written, and um, I've got lots of letters from him all on the subject of how badly, how badly written that book is. He just helped, he wanted to help me out because he thought I'd never finish. Um, people always think that the hardest thing in Wu Xia Xia Shuo is translating the Kung Fu, you know. Actually, translating the Kung Fu is a piece of cake because Western readers love all that mumbo jumbo about, you know, crouching tiger, hidden dragon. I mean, they love it, you know. And, and, and I, 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 we had no trouble translating them. I mean, actually, Jin Yong knows nothing about Kung Fu at all. He made it all up, you know. So I mean, if he can make it up, so can I. And uh, to be honest, I made up an awful lot of stuff. And I got him to sign an agreement, giving me complete freedom to do whatever I liked, to create new characters, to remove whole scenes. And unfortunately, the end result was he wasn't very happy with my translation because it was largely a recreation of a novel. And I learned most of what I, you talk about strategies. Um, mostly I learned from David because he would sit down and he'd say, John, you know, you can't translate this the same way as we did Hong Lo Mong, you know. It's just not like Hong Lo Mong, you know. This is, this is popular fiction, you know. It's, I wouldn't say pulp fiction, but it's, you know, it's not. I mean, Jin Yong himself would like to be considered on a level with Victor Hugo, you know. What a, lot, what a rubbish idea. I mean, if he's very lucky to be compared with Alexandre Dumas, you know, the Three Musketeers. That's about it. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I promise not to say anything about Jin Yong in Hong Kong because he's still alive. And, and um, <laughs> we don't get on very well anymore, I'm afraid. But um, you see, David got involved and he... He'd sit down with me in my study and say, John, this is how you do it. And this is the only answer I can give you. And he would, he would read through four or five pages of the novel very quickly. Then he'd close the novel and he'd just write down, he'd just write it, you see? You just take, you take it in in one big breath and then you just, you just abridge. So he'd turn five pages into two pages and he wouldn't look at the Chinese at all. He would just... Re, a bit like Lin Shu, you know, Lin Shu's translations. And he took great liberties with, with the Chinese. And I'm the only person who knows which chapters he did and which chapters I did. And I'm keeping it a very tight secret because then I can always say to people who want to attack me, oh, well, that was by David Hawkes. And, <laughs> and nobody will know the truth, you know. Um, and, you know, there are people who do like to attack me. I mean, I'm always getting... Recently, I was attacked for my translation of Liao Jai for pandering to the consumerist interests of Western readers, you know. And, um, you know, anyway, we won't go into that. And what was your second question again? Sorry, I cut um, you. My second question is that uh, just now you mentioned that Yang Xianyi's translation oh, yes, of... Sorry, yes, um, I knew Yang Xianyi and Gladys very well. They were very kind to me. And um, I stayed with them very often in Peking. And they're lovely people and very, very good translators. But they had their own personal preferences for things. For example, they didn't like Hong La Meng at all. They didn't like it. They thought Jia Bai Yu was a silly boy, you know, and he should learn to grow up. You know, a bit like Peter Pan. They thought Jia Bai Yu just should jolly well pull himself together, you know, and join the Communist Party. I mean, they, they were, funnily enough, although they were persecuted, they were still true believers in socialism. Right to the bitter end. I know that for a fact. And um, so, they, you know, they did Hong La Meng as a duty. The novel they really liked, which is one of their great achievements, is the other 18th century novel, Rulin Wai Shu, you know, the scholars. The wonderful translation, because that's the kind of people they were. They were also, um, they translated some of those um, Tang Chuan Chi, they're, they're very good as well. They were very humorous people, very dry, and very, um, they, loved, they loved social satire, and they loved humor, that kind of thing. I think they regarded Hong La Meng as being terribly sentimental, you know. Actually, I don't think it is, but they didn't, they didn't see it that way. Um, I think one of their big achievements was that four volumes of Lu Xun's works. But frankly, I don't think it's successful. I think Lu Xun is terribly difficult to translate. He's terribly difficult to read, actually, even in Chinese. I mean, 
he was a very, I never understood why he became such a hero. Well, I know, because he died too soon to, be, to ever, ever complain about it, you know. So, but I mean, and his unfortunate brother, of course, lived a lot longer and had a very hard time. But I mean, they didn't, I don't think their translation of Lu Xun was very successful, to be honest. Would you agree, Gilbert, you're shaking your, yeah, I think, I think we know that. I mean, they translated so much, you know, they never, they were never allowed to stop. They were like a machine, you know. And, uh, and um, they enjoyed life. They had a great, they had a great time, you know. But um, I think the Rune and Weisha was their really number one work, yeah, mm, in my opinion. Yeah, Gilbert. Right. Uh, uh, I think, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I never knew you were such a charming, charming speaker. But uh, we have to be uh, beware of the translators, and now from now on, we have to watch you very carefully, uh, just in case that you want to uh, you want to sneak out from your room someday and go to Guangyun Chi Market and uh, buy a chicken and <laughs> brandishing over your head, and we all have to be very very careful. Anyway, uh, Willie, it was a wonderful lecture. Just one footnote for those of you who may not who might have missed. What uh, John was saying is that uh, uh, he talked about Siren, which is in Cantonese, is Zapyan. Zapyan. Zapyan is the, uh, it's the May, one of the maids in the Honglang Mo. Honglang Mo. And he said uh, David Cox, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the coffee, drinking coffee, and the wonderful aroma. So he, you know, tran translated Zapyan. Fa Hei Zapyan. That is, you know, the, 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 you know, the fragrance of the flower, actually. It's just something like attacking uh, people. So it's chao yan. So it's aroma. So that's a very, very good translation. Right. And, no, I, I, I would I have just said, uh, you know, I'm really very impressed. I think, if I may say so, you're one of the most uh, knowledgeable, uh, learned, and also deep thinking translators of uh, Chinese literature right now in the world. And I'm uh, very happy that you're here, you're talking to our students, uh, helping us to learn about translator. And I think uh, you, John, are giving translation a very good name. That's my heart heartfelt uh, feeling. Thank you, thank you very much. But uh, just one question, because we are here our program is called Translation with Business. I was looking at your handout, and you said that, quote here, uh, translation is uh, on page three, number five, the ultimate aspirations of the translator. You know, I, you know, I, do, I do read your stuff, John. So, <laughs> it's, translation like an art is part of the mystery of transformation and of the life-giving com communion communion between human hearts and minds. And I think that's rather profound. I think that's, if not, if that's not theory, I to tell me what is theory. Uh, but uh, anyway, I was thinking, you know, can we sort of apply this to the business translation? Because, you know, I always thought that there's something going on, something perhaps a little bit higher we could raise business translation to a higher plane than just the translating words and phrases, contracts, negotiations, and that kind of thing. Can we sort of raise it to a higher level of the communion of hearts and minds? And, uh, and you know, of course, ultimately, ultimately, we had to get back down on earth, you know, to talk about money and all that kind of thing and doing trade and that kind of thing. But in that, during that process of translation, of doing the process of translating, of doing it, perhaps we could achieve a higher plane of aspiration, a higher plane of the intellectual satisfaction. What do you think, John? Well, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, you see, I'm, um, I'm not just living in a kind of fairyland, you know. I mean, my son's a lawyer, and he works in China. And you know, he, he's an intellectual property lawyer. And he's been saying to me for years now, um, all the time, 
we get into trouble because the badly translated contracts that are produced for writers and film stars and so on. And if only, if only there was a, a, an organization that produced really first-rate translations, these major corporations would save millions of dollars because when they go to court, they would find that the two, the two versions were absolutely identical and were very well translated. So I don't believe that there's a division. I don't believe there's a kind of a demarcation between literary translation and you know, practical translation. I think that if you train young people to, to really write well and to think clearly and to make very, very focused analyses of texts, and you can use literature for that because that's the best kind of language. And then they can transfer those skills to a very practical, for a very practical purpose and produce really high quality work. I think quality is quality, you know. And I think we know that the best quality in, in terms of, the, of written language is, is, is produced by, by writers who know what they're doing and they tend to be writers of literature. And I'll give you one final example. When I first taught translation in China in 1980, I had a small class of graduate students and they were all applying to work for the United Nations as interpreters. And the one who got the job, there was one vacancy, the one who got the job got it because he wrote very good classical Chinese and he had good calligraphy because they wanted someone who could condense a meeting into some very short paragraphs and, and his ability to write. He'd studied classical Chinese during the Cultural Revolution with his grandfather in a village. So he had this, this string to his bow, which the others didn't have. His knowledge of English wasn't so good, but he was very, very cultured, you know? And that's what got him the job, you see? And he went on to become a very successful um, translator and interpreter at the United Nations. Not translating literature, but political um, communiques and things like that. So that, in a way, that, that, that strengthens my argument, you know? I think good, Good translation is good translation, whatever you're doing, you know. Uh, Professor Mingfo, uh, actually, you know, I come to this public lecture because of the fascinating title culture and the translation. And actually this is a long-standing question in my mind. Uh, although I did not hear much about your theoretical viewpoints on this topic, I'm well impressed by the picture tour you showed us. Okay. Um, back to the top topic culture and uh, translation. We all know Cultures are very unique and quite different from each other. And in terms of this, I wonder, is everything in every culture translatable? Um, I'd like to hear your answer, because you see, currently, with the wide spread of English, I can see something which is untranslatable. Take, for example, iPhone, iPod, iPad and so on. Well, these are all products uh, made by Steve Jobs, which you showed us in the picture tour. But how can these things be called exactly in Chinese? I've never heard of it. So that triggers a question in my mind. Is everything in every culture translatable? Hope to hear your answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I I'm very reluctant to try and answer that question because it's a kind of, you're setting a trap for me, I think, um, and I'm not going to fall into it. I mean, I don't think anything is untranslatable. As, as I've, I give this um, old proverb, you know, about how people, we all have one mind, you know, ren tong si xin, xin tong si li, you know. I don't believe that, of course, you could say, to go back to the previous question, that all of Kung Fu is untranslatable because it's so uniquely Chinese, you know. and um, and I could talk about you know, how impossible it would be to translate a cricket commentary into Chinese because cricket is uniquely British. But there, once we go down that road, you know, there's no end to it. And I, I, can see, I can see whole avenues of translation theory opening up in front of me. 
and I'm not going to drive my, my, my car down any of those avenues because I know where they end up, you know. They end up in large books that are created to give academics their promotions, and um, I'm not interested in that. I, I, I can see what you're trying to get at, and of course, there are always challenges, you know, but I believe that, you know, there are, example, there are some extraordinary examples of how, of how truly committed and um, dedicated translators are able to rise to those challenges, you know. I can think of many, many examples of things which are almost untranslatable, and then suddenly someone comes along and translates them, and, you know, I, I'm amazed that the, some people would call it a kind of miracle, you know. I, 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 believe that I believe in the universality of the human spirit, and that's, all, that's the only thing that keeps me going, you know, and that's not a theory. And I, don't, I was a little bit upset when you said you didn't think I had anything to say, because actually I had something very clear to say. And if I didn't communicate it, then it's my fault. But, I mean, I do believe that translators need to go through this process of a lifelong um, assimilation and enjoyment of culture, life, experience, and so on. And as they do that, they will find themselves more and more equipped to deal with these challenges. The reason why David Hawkes was such an inventive translator and was able to translate what many people would regard as untranslatable things. For example, riddles, you know, riddles and play on, plays on words, things that other people would say were impossible to translate. He often found a way to do it because, because he had the resources and he had the dedication and he had the eternal patience to keep on trying. So I, don't, I think, you know, you might as well say that true love is impossible, you know. Or you might as well say, you know, one can, one can make these claims, you know. And of course, I, I sympathize with your concerns about the uniqueness of each individual culture. But I don't see them as being insuperable obstacles. I think that everything, everything is possible, you know. Everything is possible. As, as, um, and and um, you just have to try, you know. And then if you, if you don't succeed, you have to try harder. And if you still don't succeed, you have to, have to try harder again, you know. And um, sometimes you fail, and that's the way it is, you know. But I, 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 having worked in this business for nearly 50 years, I'm convinced that actually nothing is insuperable in this particular field. That's my personal view. I can't support it with any kind of theory. I can just talk from my personal experience, that's all. Professor Minfa, so I'm going to ask quite a little bit political sensitive question. So you mentioned about translation need to understand the root of the culture and there is no shortcut for the translation. But unfortunately, you know that Chinese, we have the traditional one and the simplified one. We will consider the simplified Chinese is a shortcut of learning Chinese culture. Do you think the simplified Chinese is harming the Chinese culture? Thank you. And maybe, do you think that the Westerners who really love the Chinese culture, they should learn the traditional one rather than learning the simplified one? Although the simplified one seems to be, become more popular in Western. Something I've had to deal with over many years as a teacher. And uh, my, my considered answer is that students of Chinese should learn both. They should learn, they should all be able to read Fan Tzu, because if you don't read Fan Tzu, you really are closing the door to a huge amount of Chinese culture. You need to read Fan Tzu, but I think that you need, if, if you want to write in Jian Tzu, that's fine, but I think you should be able to read. Unfortunately, you're quite right, more and more universities and more and more schools all over the world are just teaching Jian Tzu, simplified characters. I think it's a big mistake. I think it'll be a terrible day I know this is a current issue in Hong Kong. I think it will be a tragic day when Hong Kong ceases to use complicated characters because they are beautiful. They are the real Chinese, you know. And I often have students come to me, Australian students, New Zealand students. They come to do postgraduate work and they've lived in China for maybe three or four years. They come to see me and the first thing I do is to make them read a text in Fan Tzu and in Wenyan, in classical Chinese. And they say to me, oh, I don't want to do that, it's too hard. And I say, well, I'm sorry, you either do it or you don't do, you, I, I'm not supervising you. And then after a year, and this has happened to me four times, after one year, the same student will say to me, I only want to read Fan Tzu, you know, because I realize they're the real thing, you know. They are the true, I mean, and, and I think the argument 
that it's easier to learn Jantitsa is completely unscientific. Actually, often, Fantitsa are easier to remember because they've got more different strokes in them. And some of the simplified characters are very easy to confuse, you know. So I'm totally in favor of Fantitsa. I have no hesitation in obliging my students to read Fantitsa. And after a year of complaining and so on, they all come around to my point of view. So I'm convinced I'm right, you know. Now, I know it's a political issue, and people have been, have had terrible things happen. I mean, the great, you know, I don't know if you've heard of a poet called Chen Meng Jia. Chen Meng Jia, he got into serious trouble in the 1950s for writing an article attacking Fan Tzu, you know. And he, he, he more or less, that was more or less the end of his life, you know. It's a very political issue, and you're absolutely true, that's true. And in Taiwan, of course, the other side, it's a very political issue. Um, I have a very clear... In my own mind, I'm very clear about it, yeah. So we can take one more question. One last question. Uh. Prof Professor Minford, uh, I'm trying to um, follow on the response before the last one about the uniqueness of the culture, yeah. Um, does it mean that when we are doing the translation, we start off with something which is universal, that is common among all the cultures, and that might be the starting point with our translation, rather than starting with something which is a little bit too unique, and we might be bogged down with all those technical stuff. So say, for example, um, the translation of uh, the martial arts. Perhaps if we are into uh, Harry Potter, that kind of thing. So it's something um, fantasy. And I think is something common. And then we might have a way out. How do you feel about this? I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. I think, I, think that, I think that any translator is always balancing the unique and the universal, you know? Whether which comes first, I really don't know. I, think that they, I don't think I have a simple answer to that. I mean, with, 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 with Hawkes' work on Hong Among, you know, he was very deeply into the uniqueness of that Chinese novel. He wanted his English to be a Chinese novel in English. And yet, he was also incredibly aware of the universality of that work of art. It's a work of, it's, it's, it's a world literature. It's a piece of world literature. Um, <clears throat> and I really don't know which comes first. I don't think there is a kind of order. I think sometimes, you know, you read a poem, you might read a poem in Chinese, and um, it might vary from one poet to another. And sometimes what would strike you first of all would be the incredibly Chinese quality of that poem. For example, Du Fu would be an example. He's a poet who uses language, the Chinese language, in a way that makes him very hard to translate because it's very, very Chinese, if you'll excuse my saying so. Um, whereas someone like Bai Zhuyi writes very simple poetry, which is very easy to universalize. So, so even between those two poets, it's quite different, you know. Um, but it's no accident that that there have been very few good translations of Du Fu, for example, because his poetry is so bound up with the unique quality of the Chinese language. He's doing things with language that make it very hard to translate. Um, and I think that it varies from one type of literature to another. Um, I think also when you translate Chinese philosophy, for example, or a classic like the Yi Jing, you know, when I worked on the Yi Jing, I have to say, I was trying very hard not to universalize it. I wanted it to be a Chinese translation because my main rival, I mean, the Richard Wilhelm translation, is so Western, you know. It's so heavily influenced by Carl Gustav Jung and by all the ideas about um, uh, self-development which came out of the Jungian psychotherapy movement and Hermann Hesse and all of that. And you read, you read Richard Wilhelm's I Ching, and it's like reading a work by Carl Gustav Jung. I wanted mine to be Chinese, and I wanted to put all of that aside. But 
But of course, the moment it's not in Chinese, it ceases to be Chinese in one sense, you know. And also, if you don't think universally with a work like that, what's the point of doing it? Because it's supposed to be a book of wisdom. It's supposed to be a book that deals with life. And after all, life is life, you know, whether you're Chinese or yeah. Somali or whatever you are, you know, you're basically a human being. We belong to the same species, you know. And I, I think that all, I think most translators have to believe that, otherwise they wouldn't be wasting their time, you know. And, uh, but it's always a balance. The mix, for me, the mix is always slightly different. Each work I, I deal with, I find that you, you, you adjust the gauge slightly differently. Um, but on the whole, in answer to your question, I would say that I usually go into the, the other, the, unique of the, the uniqueness of the other first. Mm -hmm. I try to put myself into the other culture to try and understand it first, mm -hmm. and then later try to um, re reshape it in a way that's more universal. So that would be my normal. That's just from my own mm -hmm. personal experience. Mm. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Manford. I guess that's question wraps up our today's talk. And thank you all for coming. May I suggest that our fellow students please wait for the guests sitting in the middle leave first. Thank you. I hope you all enjoy the talk today.